She's citing nervousness uh, every time. Uh, and I'm not very good in introductions in general. So, I'm so, uh, so thanks for coming. And, and today, this is a great pleasure um, to introduce a very well-dressed Jen um, <laughs> for, for his defense. Um, so Jen, Jen is originally from China, and he went. He did his undergraduate at Fudan University. Um, was training in, uh, in sort of very uh, comes from a very quantitative background, um, and he had the fortune or misfortune of joining my lab. Somebody who's not um, very well trained in in, in the in quantitative approaches to science. So, so for both of us, this was a, a great learning experience, and I. I have to say, I learned a lot from Jen, and hopefully he feels he learned a lot from us. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it, it led to a very interesting project that I probably, if, if, if it wasn't Jen, we would have never worked on. Um, and some people, when they hear about the project, they're kind of surprised that um, somebody in my lab uh, worked on such uh, kind of more theoretical aspects of evolutionary biology. Um, but for me, it was, it was, like I said, it was a wonderful experience to learn about all these new things that you know, I, I think about abstractly, but when it comes to actually really trying to figure out how to solve the problems at that, that level, um, Jen talked a lot about it. Um, um, Jen is, is, as you guys, you know, has a, a very broad interest. He's, he's, he's one of those students that it doesn't matter what the topic is at Lebanese, and, and my group is pretty diverse, and he talks as well. Um, always have uh, interesting insights that come from a direction that most of us don't necessarily think about, which, which uh, I always appreciate. Um, and I don't want to know, he has, a, he has a very interesting story, and, and he's eager to tell you, so I'm not going to take a lot more time. But um, just to remind everybody what, how defense works is that we're going to have a formal um, seminar um, there's going to be time in the end for questions from the, from the audience, and then we're going to ask everybody to, to leave, and the only uh, people who stay are in the committee. Um, and we should be done over, sort of around one. We're going to have a little reception um, at 3 or 9. Um, please feel free to join us. And uh, with that, Jen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think I don't have to introduce myself. You did a pretty great job. So I'm going to directly go to my talk, which is about the evolutionary and functional roles of synonymous codon usage in carriers. So first, let us start with a really frequently used assumption in evolutionary biology, that is, synonymous mutations are generally neutral. So first, we know that different nucleotide triplets can encode for the same amino acid, and this relationship is described by the codon table. For example, the phytonanine can be encoded by both UU or UUC codons. And according to the central dogma, we think that the information of the proteins is encoded by the mRNAs, and mRNAs uh, synthesis is directed by the DNA synthesis, which leads to the assumption that synonymous mutations are neutral. So synonymous mutation means that the mutation is uh, from one codon to synonymous codons, so the amino acid sequence does not change. For example, here, this is the DNA coding sequence of a protein. It is transcribed to an mRNA and then translated into a peptide sequence, and after uh, post-translational modifications, foldings, or other processes, it results in the mature proteins. But um, if there is a synonymous mutation happening to this GAC codon, to a GAT codon, the amino acid sequence still not changed. It's still a, an aspiratic acid. So it is assumed that the mature proteins will be essentially the same as the original one. So this is. So people usually use synonymous mutations as proxies for neutral mutations. However, there are some phenomena that seem to contradict 
uh, this assumption, which is codon usage bias. One would naively assume that if different stimuli, uh, you prefer to use your mouse, uh, because they was um, oh yeah. So um, codon usage bias states that even though different synonymous codons encode for the same amino acid, they are actually used with pretty different frequencies, and it seems really not random. For example, there is species specific bias, which states that for the same amino acid. For different species, they prefer different types of synonymous codons. So this is, these are six codons for the alginine. In C. elegans, the roundworm, the codon HEG and CGU are more preferred. One just saw the nanogaster is this CGG codon that is more preferred. And there is also gene-specific bias within the same genome. Here are two genes from the Drosophila genome, the CG31609, which is a testis-specific protease inhibitor gene. And this actin 5 c is housekeeping uh, highly expressed gene, the actin. And we can see that CG31609 strongly prefer the UUU for filonanamine and AAA for lysine, while for this housekeeping gene, actin 5 c the UUC codon and AAG codons are strongly preferred, respectively. And we can see that because this is highly expressed housekeeping genes, and the UUC and AAG codons are actually the more frequently used codons in Drosophila across the entire genome. So people have proposed that maybe this gene-specific codon usage patterns has been associated with the expression level of the gene. So here are some examples of how synonymous mutations might be non-neutral. First, this GAU codon might be translated with faster speed so that the resulting concentration of the mature proteins might be upregulated <coughs> with this synonymous mutation. And usually, if a codon is translated with relatively higher, uh, uh, higher efficiency, it is termed an optimal codon. And on the other hand, the faster translation might also mess up the co-translational folding or other processes like modifications, phosphorylations, which will result in different folding patterns and structures of the mature proteins, even though these two peptide chains might have similar uh, amino acid sequences. One of such examples, which might not be influenced by color usage, but can stay a principle, is the prions, that the prions can chain between different isoforms, uh, different folding patterns. And then the next possibility is that the change in the nucleotide sequence of the mRNA might result in lower stability of the mRNA and shorter half-life, which will result in lower concentration of proteins. And the change in the nucleotide sequences might change the accessibility of microRNA to the mRNA. For example, here, if the microRNA is less accessible to the uh, mRNA sequence due to the synonymous locations, this mRNA might have a longer half-life which could result in higher concentration of the proteins. And if we really go back to the DNA level, there is also epigenetic modifications. Here, the synonymous location leads the CG dinucleotide to a TG dinucleotide. And we know that the CG dinucleotide um, sometimes are associated with the uh, epigenetic modifications. So synonymous mutations might change the epigenetic modifications, which will then result in modified levels of protein expression. And more dramatically, the synonymous mutations might make the gene generate a new alternative splicing patterns, especially in eukaryotes, a loss of the original uh, splicing patterns, which will even change the sequence of the mature mRNAs, either resulting in a dysfunctional mRNA, or this mRNA will be translated into a completely different peptide sequence. And I should state that all of these possibilities have some type of um, empirical reports that people have reported cases where these situations can happen. So there seems to be an apparent conundrum between the frequently used assumption that synonymous mutations are generally neutral in population genetics and evolutionary biology with the empirical evidence of non-neutral synonymous mutations 
for several decades. And this one is the earliest paper that I can find which shows an evidence, uh, an empirical evidence for non interest non application. And this kind of contradiction may be explained actually by two non mutually exclusive uh, statements. First is that even though there is universal existence of code on usage bias, actually <coughs> this bias might not be necessarily uh, the results of natural selection. Other processes, such as mutational bias and genetic drift, might influence the code usage bias. So mutational bias states that even though the mutation happens between two synonymous codons, the GAG and GAA are both for glutamic acid, if the G to A mutation rate is higher than the A to G mutation rate, then we would have um, asymmetric frequencies of these two codons. And genetic drift is just a, a random process that fits the alleles, no matter if it's deleterious, beneficial, or neutral. And also, there is another possibility that the reports we know about the non neutral synonymous mutations might only represent rare cases uh, in the entire uh, life uh, atmosphere. And actually, maybe most of the synonymous mutations are generally are just neutral. But actually, people have not been really successful in verifying these two explanations. So my question is that are non-neutral synonymous mutations truly rare, or they're actually more prevalent than we usually assume? So there are some challenges in resolving this question. First is that empirical testing of the generality of non-neutral synonymous mutations is nearly impractical. We cannot do millions of tests of all possible or most possible synonymous mutations to happening to most genes in most known species. And so we have to rely on the computational methods, the quantitative approaches. But even though we want to use the quantitative approaches, there are some technical challenges. First, it's about the applicability of the methods. Most of the computational methods that try to assess the effect of natural selection on synonymous mutations so far requires high quality data at a population level genetic variations to really assess the, for example, the effective population size and selection coefficients. So if we really want to test the generality, we have to find a method which is more uh, broadly applicable. And there is another challenge, which is the statistical power. And most of the methods right now only focus on a fourfold degenerate codon. So the fourfold degenerate codons means that one amino acid has four and only four different synonymous codons in body. And they usually, and this is one type of method. And another type of method, they just treat codons with different degrees of degeneracy separately. And these kind of technical manipulations really restrict their statistical power. So my uh, goal is to find the widely applicable and highly statistically powerful method that can really directly test whether synonymous mutations are, uh, whether the non-neutral synonymous mutations are truly rare. And I built my method based on this selection mutation drift model, which was proposed in the early 1990s. <coughs> Actually, this kind of method has, this model has been applied by previous researchers in several ways. But they usually focus on estimating the effect, the selection coefficient, that is the natural selection, which requires, as I mentioned before, high quality genetic variation data at a population level. So I tried to find a different approach. I asked, what if the natural selection is not there? What if synonymous mutations are just neutral? What will happen between the colon usage bias and mutation bias and genetic drift? Actually, with this null hypothesis, I mathematically proved that the effect of genetic drift is also canceled if there is no natural selection on synonymous mutations. So the colon usage bias should be primarily determined by mutational bias if the null hypothesis holds. And so we can calculate the expected mutational bias, which is a combination of the estimated de novo mutation rates 
from the observed codon usage. And then we can calculate the expected codon usage from this expected mutational bias. And then we will compare the observed and expected <coughs> codon usage. And if there is significant difference, it means that this non hypothesis does not hold. That natural selection has a significant impact on synonymous mutation, at least for this gene analyzed. And I applied this approach to 40 eukaryotic species across different kingdoms, from protista, bounds, fungus, and animal <coughs> to animal. And we can see that this line shows the 10%, and the, each column here shows the proportion of G, protein coding genes that carry significant signatures of natural selection on their synonymous codon usage patterns. So most of the species here, we can see that there is a non-negligible proportion of genes that are affected by natural selection on synonymous mutations, no matter they're codata, multicellular, or unicellular, that is protista, and even this uh, this stelium is a species that has two phases. One is more like multicellular organism, and the other is unicellular organism. So we can see that we should not neglect the effect of non neutral synonymous mutations. And different species are affected by such um, mutations with different strengths. So there might be some plate specific selection patterns of on the non neutral synonymous mutations. So the take home message of this. The first part is that natural selection on synonymous codon usage broadly shapes eukaryotic genomes. And also the impact of the such selection may vary dramatically across different plates. And then, after we confirm the existence of non neutral synonymous patients, we would ask what might be the biological functions of these codon <coughs> usage biases. So I decided to use the model organism for applied and Drosophila melanogaster to resolve this question. This is because the genome of Drosophila is really well annotated, and we have multiple databases about their gene expression patterns, their gene functions, and other aspects. And there are really abundant genetic and transgenic tools that are going to do experimental manipulation on their genomes and observe the effect. So this graph here, is a colon usage heat map. Each column, each column here represents a gene, and each row represents a codon. If we see this red thing, it means that these genes use these codons with higher frequencies. If we see some cyan blocks, it means that these genes use these codons with lower frequencies. And the black one is just intermediate codon usage patterns. So we can see that if we cluster the genes according to their codon usage patterns, they split into two major clusters, the cluster A genes and cluster B genes. And for the cluster A genes, if we zoom in, we can see that generally they prefer these CAA, GAA, and AA codons, and these GAPA, and PDB codons for these amino acids. So it seems that even though um, different species have their species-specific codon usage bias, there is also dramatic intragenomic uh, across different genes codon usage bias. And some genes strongly prefer the rare codons. You can see that most of the genes in the genomes do not prefer these codons, but these cluster A genes do. Now, what does these cluster A genes do in a real organism? Well, first I tested whether there is association between the codon usage patterns shown by the codon usage uh, heat map and the annotation of gene, spatial gene expression patterns. So here we can see that this, these are cluster A genes. This is the enrichment, the folding, folding enrichment. In the male accessory gland, cluster mm -hmm. A genes are overrepresented. While in the cluster B genes, which strongly prefers the common codons and do not prefer the rare codons, the testis specific and male accessory gland specific genes are underrepresented. So there seems to be some association between preference for rare codons and male reproductive system. And also, several other analyses also support this finding. First, 
is the sex-specific gene expression. We can see that in cluster A genes, the male-specific genes are significantly overrepresented, while in cluster B genes, the male-specific genes are underrepresented. And I also tested whether there is association between the codon usage patterns and gene ontology annotations of uh, protein functions. For those who do not uh, who are not familiar with GO, the gene ontology, is just a system or a database that has tremendous annotations of the possible and confirmed gene functions of various genes in multiple species. So we can see that in cluster A genes, the extracellular and secreted proteins seem to be overrepresented, while the cytoplasmic proteins are underrepresented. So the hypothesis here seems to be that um, there is some association between the preference for rare codons and a secreted male reproductive system specific proteins. And the explanation for this kind of phenomenon might be like this. Let's see, let, let us assume there are two tissues, and each tissue have different tRNA expression profile. Here, there are a lot of red tRNAs and few green tRNAs. And red RNA is recognizing these rare codons on the mRNA. While in the tissue 2, there are a lot of uh, green tRNAs and few red tRNAs. So we would expect that because this mRNA is more adapted to this specific tRNA pool, it might be translated with higher rates. While in tissue 2, the exact same mRNA is less adapted to the local tRNA pool and it might be uh, translated with lower uh, efficiency. And this hypothesis first requires us to find the candidate codons that underline this tissue-specific effect. And actually, if we analyze the rare codons preferred by cluster A, only these three codons have their perfect matched here on the NA codons. And the, these codons, actually, they have to share the codons that perfectly match their more common synonymous codons. So it seems that these codons are actually the ones that underlie the tissue specific patterns, while these codons might serve some other functions. And we tested whether there is truly tissue specific tRNA expression. The method I used was tRNA modern blot, and here the top panel is the tRNA modern blot of the tRNA that perfectly match the common codon, AAG of LACI. And this panel is the, shows the tRNA perfectly match the rare codons, AAA of the LACI. And the four categories we tested are the head, male reproductive system, thorax, and abdomen, uh, excluding the reproductive system, and the whole body as a control. We can see that the tRNA that perfectly matching, uh, perfectly matches the rare codons is overrepresented or highly enriched in a male reproductive system. While this kind of pattern is not shown for the tRNA that match the common codon. So there is truly some association between the preference of a specific codon and the overrepresentation of the cognate tRNAs in specific tissues. And the next step I want to do is to really manipulate the codon usage of a reporter gene to see if I can really manipulate its spatial expression patterns of a gene just by synonym applications. The system I use is called the UAS GAL4 system in the software. So it is a system that controls the expression of transgenic constructs. Here, the GAL4 is a protein that is a transcription factor. Its expression is controlled by some tissue-specific or other types of enhancers. For example, we can put a global enhancer here to drive the GAL4 expression everywhere in the body of Drosophila. And this GAL4 will bind to a promoter called UAS. And the UAS will drive the expression of the reporter gene, which will be either an EGFP or RFP, the fluorescent gene here. And the construct we build are transgenic thighs that co-express the m which is a type of R RFP serves, serving as a control, and EGFP, whose codon usage will be manipulated. And our expectation is that by using common codons to encode all amino acids, 
for these two other genes, we might see that the tissue-specific expression patterns of these two other genes is not shown up just by using common codons. But if we use rare codons for the three specific amino acids, the glutamic acid, lysines, and glutamines, we encode the uh, residues ADP, GFP, we might see that the spatial expression patterns of the RFP is not changed. While we might see the inhibition of the ex expression of EGFP in tissues other than the reproductive system or the enhancement of the EGFP in the reproductive system of both of them. So these are my uh, high expectations. And to really test the tissue specificity, we need to find a focal <coughs> tissue and a control tissue. Actually, it's pretty hard to find an ideal control tissue in Drosophila. Uh, I finally decided to use something called the HPZ, the hind gut proliferation zone, which locates at the junction of mid gut and hind gut. This is because the gut of the Drosophila is pretty soft. In general, it's pretty soft. So when I put it under the microscope, usually I really cannot find a region where it is comparable across different specimens. But this part, which, which has a lot of stem cells, seems to be really rigid and relatively stable and can survive longer as a fresh tissue under the microscope. So I chose this one as my control tissue. And here it shows the male reproductive system of fruit flies. What I focused on is the tip of this accessory ground. And there were two types of cells here, the main cells and secondary cells like these ones are secondary cells. Secondary cells are really important for uh, secreting the uh, proteins that are necessary for the function of seminal fluids. And they're really active in terms of gene expression. And what I did is I expressed the aforementioned uh, repeller genes globally in, just, in two types of uh, genotypes. So the left panel here shows a fruit fly that expresses the EGFP whose residues are encoded all by common codons. And the right panel shows the flies where EGFP, where the uh, lysines, glutamic acid and glutamines are encoded by rare codons and other residues are encoded by common codons. So the top two shows the junction between the mid gut and hind gut. And we can focus on this part. And the lower panel shows the secondary cells of accessory glands. And we can see that these two parts generally have similar signal strengths. But the signal strengths of the EGFP that uses rare codons actually are stronger than the ones that uses rare codons. So actually, <coughs> genes uses rare codons, which are usually assumed to be non-optimal, can actually enhance translation in specific tissues and serve somehow like a local optimal codons. So the take-home message of these analysis on the functions of gene-specific codon usage bias is that first, the gene-specific codon usage patterns are heterogeneous, even, the, even in the same genome. And second, gene-specific codon usage patterns are strongly are somehow or strongly associated with specific gene functions that like I mentioned before, like tissue specificity. And also the preference for specific rare codons is enough to drive the change in the functions of the gene. You do not need to change <coughs> all the codons, modify the entire uh, the codon usage of the entire sequence, but just focus on several specific types of codons is enough to change the functions of genes. And also the biological functions of the synonymous codon usage are really complex dependent. It is generally hard to really <coughs> say what codon is optimal, what codon is not optimal, without knowing the exact uh, set of plasmic or biochemical background of where the genes is functioning. And from the gene-specific part, I go into the intragenic part. And the intragenic part of colon usage bias might be important for the following reasons. 
let's say this mRNA has generally a leverage colonization patterns, and the, the overall colonization pattern of this mRNA is not different from the entire gene. But it is possible that some part of it are concentrated with specific types of codons. For example, here are concentrated with common codons, which are presumably translated with faster speed. And here are concentrated with rare codons, which may be, which may be translated with lower efficiency. And as the ribosome goes to translate this entire sequence, the co-translational folding and modifications might be affected by the varied speed or efficiency of the translation here. So that if we only introduce some synonymous codons here, we might even change the structures or functions of the uh, nascent or the mature at that chain. So if this kind of intragenic codon visit patterns really exist, then some signatures we found uh, uh, some signatures may be masked if we only focus on the gene specific colonization bias and ignore the possible intragene colonization bias. And we can also say that maybe few synonymous codons happen to some specific regions within the gene can uh, drive dramatic uh, phenotypic effects, and which might explain some of the, some of the empirical example or reports uh, observed by the researchers. And there might also be some association between the codon usage, local codon usage patterns, the codon clusters, and uh, the protein domains, which might be, which is usually predicted from the amino acid sequences. So to find out the, these kind of putatively functional codon clusters, I call them PFCC for short. I design a computational method to find out these PFCCs. The logic is relatively simple. I just, for example, we put a window on a coding sequence of a protein and calculate the codon usage pattern of this window and compare it with some background codon usage patterns. This background can be either the gene specific codon usage patterns or the whole genome codon usage patterns. And if there is some significant differences between these two, it mean, means that the window specific codon usage cannot be <coughs> adequately explained by either uh, by neither whole genome colon usage patterns nor gene specific colon usage patterns. And thus natural selection is highly likely to affect the colon usage pattern of this window. And we can slide this window across the entire gene to find out whether there are multiple color clusters in the gene. And uh, here is an example of how the how the results will look like. The value axis shows the corrected p-values. This line shows the 0.05 p-value. And the horizontal axis shows the coordinates of the start of a sliding window. And we can see that there were several parts across the coding sequence of this type 1 voltage gated sodium channel in Trisophila that has a significantly different codon usage pattern compared to either uh, compared to both the gene-specific codon usage pattern and the whole genome codon usage pattern. And I use this method to screen for about 14,000 protein coding genes in the Drosophila genome and, and identified about 3,000 PFCCs in about uh, 1,500 genes. And I found that most of the genes, uh, most of the PFCCs are, are identified strongly prefer rare codons. So this graph shows how it looks like. The TCAI is a measurement of how likely the cluster prefers rare codons or common codons. If it prefers rare codons, the TCAI will be closer to minus one. If it strongly prefers common codons, its value will be roughly one. And these are the histograms showing the distribution of the PFCCs across along this axis. We can see that most of the identified ones strongly prefer rare codons. Well, there are still some common codon clusters and codon clusters with intermediate codon usage patterns. And these two are actually not identified by previous reports. And the results here might represent the true effect that rare codon clusters are more frequent 
than other types of coda clusters, or it might somehow be an artifact of the easier detection of rare coda clusters on the network, because it's easier to test the enrichment of the rare than the enrichment of the common. And what might be the possible functions of these PFCCs? Well, again, gene ontology analysis. I found that the genes that carry these PFCCs, or even genes that carry these PFCCs, the membrane binding proteins and transcription related proteins are overrepresented, while the ribosomal and mitochondrial proteins are underrepresented. So I guess that there might be some association between the PFCCs and the transmembrane domains or transmembrane helices. So I tested whether there is really some association between them. And the result is kind of tricky. You can see that there are some PFCCs that locate near some type of transmembrane helices, but most of them, among the 3,000, like most of them are not associated with transmembrane helices. Well, um, this is somehow unexpected, but explainable because maybe these PFCCs are associated with other types of protein domains in the transmembrane proteins. So I tested the association between the PFCCs and the one called, uh, and the protein domains annotated by the PFAM protein domain database. So PFAM is a database that contains a lot of information of the annotated uh, protein domains in multiple tissues from way back to the uh, bacteria, to the eukaryotes, and human beings. And you can see that, yes, there are more, gene, more PFCCs associated with the PFAM protein domains, but still the majority of these PFCCs really, really do not know uh, what type of protein domain is predicted from the amino acid sequences are associated with them. So the simplest Result conclusion would be that, well, it might be that these PFCCs are actually not necessarily associated with the amino acid level protein domains, but they represent some nucleic acid level functional domains that control the genes of the, uh, that control the protein coding genes or even the structures and functions of the mature proteins. And so far for the Third projects I've done, and here's the summary of my thesis. First, the existence, the broad existence of non-mutual synonymous mutations. We really should not just naively assume that all synonymous mutations are mutual. When we want to test whether uh, some types of selection is there or whether the evolution can be generally described by mutual evolution, we really think, need to think about the possibility of natural selection on synonymous mutations. And also, secondly, the gene-specific coding bias is associated with gene functions. And within the same genome, different genes can have really different coding usage patterns. And the biological functions of synonymous coding usage is context-dependent. It is really hard, actually, to predict the exact functions of the coding usage simply from the entire gene's coding usage patterns, or even the gene-specific colon usage patterns, as we have seen the intra-gene and colon usage bias. And also the putatively functional colon clusters we have found might represent some previously uh, overlooked important nucleic acid level domains that control the functions of protein coding genes. And I'm not sure if I skip, spoke too fast, but I really want to save a lot of time for my acknowledgments because there are a lot of people I really want to thank. So first, thank my committee members for helping me a lot. I have to emphasize a lot with my thesis because actually um, I kind of switched my projects to, uh, from my qualifying exams to my thesis proposal. And in this process and after that, my committee members, Dr. Ben Shahar, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Duncan, Dr. Olsen, Dr. Peller, and Dr. Zahra, uh, gave me a lot of helpful, helpful, suggest, helpful suggestions about how their research should be done, what might be the KDS of my research, and what types of experiments or data analysis I might need to think about. And I also thank Dr. Grant and Dr. Cohen for giving me the chance to be supported by the Genome Analysis Training Program, supported by both 
uh, NIH and WashU. And I have communicated a lot with different types of biologists, computation biologists, and even some industrial guys just by joining this program. And I really thank this program because I had to take the genomics course as I joined this program. And it turned out that is the most useful course, uh, the, the most useful course I've taken during, during my PhD study. <laughs> okay. And I would also thank the current and previous members of my thesis lab and Shahar's lab. Thank, I thank my advisor a lot for providing me a really useful platform. And he, he's really eager to reach out for all kinds of resor resources like the GATP, which on one hand, save money for him. And <laughs> on the other hand, give some extra chances for his lab members to retrain yourself, improve yourself, themselves. And um, I would also thank the previous uh, postdocs like Xiaoling Gu and the first PhD student graduate from the lab, Xin Guozhen, for helping me with the first several weeks and months in this lab. I thank Katie. Uh, I'm not sure if her family is really more Really thank her for giving me helpful information about how the EPD pro program runs and what kind of <coughs> courses might be useful and how I should improve my talk and speech. And also previous postdocs like Eric and Alexis helped me a lot with the writings and uh, gave me some really useful information about uh, what people think about synonymous code on usage and what type of results might be impactful from uh, different perspectives. And I thank my, oh, so in my, my, I want to say my classmates, but actually in my lab, it's Ross, Cassie, Yuching, and technician Eric, um, and the master student Lulu for helping me with the research, writing, entertainment, arranging the celebration after this. And, all kinds of other things. And I would also thank the NIH funding for supporting my research. I would also like to thank members in Dr. Zahir's staff. They also helped me a lot with the molecular experiments like the here and other blocks and the rest of blocks. And they yeah, helped me learn something about the radioactive stuff. I have to <laughs> take the test every year right now. And thank Ben, Carrie, the previous postdocs, taught me a lot about how to do the plots. And Hannah, the technician, and also Zina, helped me with the rest of plots and making the plates, the media for the bacteria. And thank the graduate student, uh, Leo, Erica, Catherine, for helping me with the uh, experiments I've done in the previous year. Actually, Leo and I were doing experiments over the last year. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I would also like to thank Dr. Duncan's lab, Ian, Diane, and Paula. They helped me a lot with the um, transgenic flies and microscopic imaging. And I really thank Ian for providing me information about the DPP, which warned me that that experiment might not work. And it really did not work. <laughs> okay. And I would also like to thank the labs that I did my rotation in, the Strassman lab. I spent my first several months in the United States in their labs, and they taught me and helped me a lot for setting up all kinds of stuff here in the US in St. Louis. And actually, I think I was here because Dr. Strassman liked me after the interview. I only did interview over the sky across the Pacific Ocean. So I really thank her for that. <laughs> okay, and thank Debbie, their lab manager, and Jeff, their previous postdocs, and John Jun, their previous postdocs, for helping me with some experiments done in the lab. And their students, Tracy and Kelly, taught me something about the uh, big stadium and some Perl and uh, programming stuff. And I would also like to thank the Dr. Shiverska, which which is no longer here, but the members there helped me a lot. And after my rotation there, I decided I will never touch mice experiments anymore. <laughs> They're just too exhausting and expensive. 
And I would also like to thank the three Allens in our program, Dr. Garland Allen, Dr. Ellen Larson, and Dr. Ellen Pemberton. I have to emphasize that the spelling of the Allens are different. <laughs> and they helped me with uh, the writings of my papers and taught me, especially Gar, taught me how to kind of filter and find the most important papers that shape the general uh, panorama or the landscape of a discipline, which helped me a lot to find those really ancient or some very first papers dating as anonymous and dating as unusual or non -mutual. And yeah, I like their kind of philosophical thoughts about this. And I would also like to thank the EPB program and biology department staff for helping me with the documents, files, like Stacia helped me a lot with filling all kinds of forms I needed to complete my program. And I'd like to thank Devin for reserving the rooms for me. Actually, we changed the rooms for three times. The time of the rooms for three times, because every time when I said all the time, there was something new happening, and I had to change the time. So thank him a lot. And also other uh, staff, and also Mike helped me with the technical issues of the screens and poster printing, and also uh, Carl, oh, I should put Carl here. Carl Hennigy for helping with the poster printing. And also the guys in the uh, uh, stockroom, Jen, Kelly, and Jerry, for helping my lab and me to get the necessary equipment for our experiments. And I'd also like to thank Marta for really go through my uh, thesis dissertation and gave me some really important and helpful suggestions about how to organize uh, the thesis. And I would also like to thank my cohort in the EPD program of my year, Bo, Kim, Sarah, Jason, and Kevin. I feel sorry that Jason and Kevin did not finish their program. And I'm the only boy in my cohort right now. I feel kind of <laughs> <laughs> But they really helped me a lot, especially in the first two years to find out useful resources for like apartments, readings, and like what kind of books and courses might be useful for me. And I also like to thank previous uh, graduate students, Pooja and Jordan, for helping me with um, the population genetics course. Actually, Jordan kind of kind of like the our cheating techniques for the <laughs> population genetics. Homeworks, like we only have questions we usually ask them. And I also like to thank my Chinese friends here. These may read Greek to you or actually Chinese to you, but yeah, they help me a lot with um, the live and studies. And because most of them are scholars and some of them are doctors right now, I think I'm one of the latest guy to graduate among them. And they helped me and provided some useful suggestions about my thesis. And I would also like to thank all the servers who remember the courses, my favorite courses at the restaurant, and they're more little than uh, the olive olive oil. Actually, I did not cook, and I kind of be eating around the campus a lot. And a lot of servers can remember, oh, remember that guy who won some kind of courses today. And, yeah, I think it's a good way to enjoy San Luis to really go to different kinds of restaurants. And the restaurants are really diverse here at this And also, thank my dad and mom. These are how they look like online, officially, in their <laughs> formal suits. You can, find these, you can find these pictures on Google Image. But this is what actually they look like. <laughs> Uh, actually, my mom is 10 days older than my dad, and they were actually kindergarten classmates. <laughs> but I am not. <laughs> <laughs> but I am not as lucky as them. And thank has <laughs> <laughs> not shown up in recent years. It made me really focus on my studies and research. <laughs> and also, <laughs> Thank this little boy for not giving up doing some academic stuff for more than 26 years. So here I was observing the ants, 
was annotating the figures according to the format. It should be some supplementary figures. <laughs> People would like these figures to be the manifest figure. And after like um, 26 years, become some kind of PhD students with beard. You know. <laughs> so they are not as cute as before. And the next step, I will join Dr. David Bronstad at Wisconsin Medicine. And actually, Dr. Brown graduated from the, this program, from this school when it was still called the Evolutionary and Population Biology Program, not the EP. This is some <coughs> archaeological stuff, and I think every EP student should know that. And I don't know about this. And I'm going to do something about the origins of life, mainly about the theoretical stuff. And possibly more years to go and become Professor Pong. That is my goal, but I hope these years will not be as long as these years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And thanks very much for attending my events. And feel free to ask me any kind of questions about the academics and other stuff. Thank you a lot. So have you seen any correlation between the RNA stability and... So the RNA st stability actually was kind of well studied in the bacteria. So that is the very first hypothesis proposed to explain the non-interesting applications. And actually in Drosophila, um, the CG and the codons are usually more preferred than the AP and the codons. And usually the CG enriched mRNAs are more stable than the AP enriched. So there might be some uh, there, there might be some association there, but some interesting thing is that in the yeast, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the AP and the codons are sometimes more preferred than the CG and the codons. So that will might not be universal and might be complex to that. Any more questions? In any of the other eukaryotes that you looked at, was there a bias for rare codons in the male specific? Um, so I've not tested the bias in, like in general, I did not test that, but I can tell you that in some other species, I found several genes that are homologs or the autologs of some genes that are uh, male reproductive system specific and also strongly prefer rare codons. For example, the, usually there were two types of cytochrome C's in the organism, especially in the invertebrate, the cytochrome C tested specific and so the proxy the uh, somatic type. And usually the somatic type prefers common codons and the testis specific type prefers rare codons. But I've only found several examples there and do not know if that is on that is also a general rule in other species. You know, transmembrane um, proteins, have you had a chance to kind of swap the, uh, the rare codon with them? That is a good question. Protein. That runs into the technical <laughs> issue. Actually, I've constructed the cytochrome C, oh no, it's not the, uh, the voltage gated sodium channel uh, type 1 knockout plasmid. I wanted to do that with the CRISPR techniques, but during the process, I found that manipulating the codon usage results in really weird GC or AT content, which made the IDT, the company, unable to make the, <laughs> the sequence of, and that is a technical issue. Yeah, you know, try with DPP as well. Yeah, the DPP is another issue. Like I actually we've made the DPP insert, but it is it it was. Dominantly lethal, or no, not dominantly, but dominantly sterile, and with really low viability. So I could not continue on that path. So the theoretical stuff is one hand, but when you really want to do experiments, you're restricted by a lot of things. Any more questions? And What's your favorite restaurant? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for now, let's see. In general, or Chinese fashion? I think Taiko. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. good. Yeah, that's good. Alright. <laughs> 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 Any more questions?
Well, you have to, before you go, you have to do the list of you know, rank all the Chinese restaurants. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Any other questions? Okay, thank you, everybody. Now we have to ask everybody to uh, the room.